uh, has to be with regards to ENT, OSCE and ENT. Um, this is this, uh, the eyes examination is not included. Okay. This, and um, what I will discuss with you will just be the skills uh, with regards to the um, uh, the side questions is up to you. Okay? It's up to you to study. So how are you, class? Not, not fine, dog. How is uh, COVID in India? Yes, dog. Too much COVID. Too much COVID. Yeah, even COVID. here, uh, healthcare workers are affected. Too much cold, dog. Yes. Actually, uh, right now, I am in ICU. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's start. Hello, dog. If you have any question, just um, don't hesitate to uh, butt in okay, because I cannot see you raise your hand. So just turn on your um, your microphone and just say, hey, dog, I have a question. Okay. <clears throat> DJ, DJ, mm. I take an anon five minutes. Mm. Okay, good afternoon again. So, my task is to discuss to you the focus, ear, nose, and throat history taking and physical examination. I will not deal much with, um, with history taking because that is, um, that you can read and um, of course when we talk of focus we will ask specifically on the um, is I, history on the nose on the throat and in the ear okay so when you do an examination of the ears nose throat and even the neck these are the basic um, equipment or instruments that you will need. Of course, you need to have a chair with headdress um, if, if, uh, if possible so that your uh, patient will be comfortable. You need to have a light source. So your light source uh, can be um, headlamp. Okay, so you can have that if, but of course, at home, you don't have that, so just uh, a very good light source will be enough. Uh, of course, instrument cabinet, head mirror. Um, why do we need to have head mirror? Because um, when we do the examination, we're using both our hands. Okay. You need to have tongue depressors. Um, of course, when you uh, did, that can be used uh, because when you use when you do your rhinoscopy as much as possible, you have to have your uh, tongue depressor method. But nevertheless, it is okay for you to use your tongue depressors. Very important is otoscope. Okay, I forgot to put the tuning fork. <laughs> Tuning fork. Okay. And of course, your uh, laryngeal mirror. Of 
for your rhinoscopy. Anyway, um, to go back, so um, technically, uh, your, your examiner will just be very particular with this. Tongue depressors, the otoscope, the tuning fork. The rest you can do without. But during the examination, as much as possible, you have these three. So um, this is how you use your uh, head mirror. So why, are we, why do we need um, to have head mirror? That is because you need your both hands to do the examination. And having a head mirror can be very helpful to focus the light, especially when you are um, checking the ears. So this is how to focus the head mirror. I will not, um, I will not discuss that much with you. If I am your facilitator or your examiner, I will not ask that. But of course, you need to, you need to read that because uh, I am not the sole uh, examiner who will be doing with you, who will be checking on your skills. So this is the autos, this is other di uh, basic instruments. Of course, you need to have your diagnostic set. This is this ear specula or speculum. You need your nasal specula, okay? Especially when you check, when you do your anterior rhinoscopy. Dang the depressors and of course your laryngoscopic mirrors. Okay. <clears throat> this is your posterior rhinoscopy mirror. Then your nasal and aural forceps. Uh, when, why, uh, why, um, when do you usually need this? Especially if you do your uh, nasal packing, okay? Or if you want to uh, remove a uh, foreign body inside the ear. And of course, the tuning fork. Ear examination. How to go about the ear? Ah, okay. I will, I will answer your questions. You need to have your otoscope and you need to have your tuning fork test. Some... Uh, it will be emphasized to you in the examination that you have those um, instruments. In the event that you don't have, I cannot answer for the other uh, faculty, but if you will be under me, um, you need to improvise, okay? Try to improvise if you don't have the instruments uh, because I will not... Um, you need to show to me how to do it properly, okay? So how to do the ear examination? Of course, when you do your history taking, um, these are the classic symptoms why your patient comes to you. So your patient will come to you because of not really, uh, sometimes it's not deafness, but there is a decreased hearing, okay? So you have to ask uh, what, or you have to ask the occupation of your patient if there is trauma, okay? Like um, the very important is occupation and of course trauma. Then uh, some will uh, complain of tinnitus. So the ringing of the ear. Some will go to you because of otorrhea or ear discharge or ear pain, and some will come to you because of vertigo. So those are the classic symptoms of ear disease. So you need to also ask if there were previous histories of ear surgeries or head injuries, if there's a family history of deafness, if your patient has um, um, past medical history like or they, do they have a stroke before or cardiovascular diseases? Or did, um, did recently, did your patient took, uh, take any drugs like gentamicin or other autotoxic 
drugs. And of course, um, if there's an exposure to noise, so this is an occupational hazard. So those are the things that uh, you will need to ask when you do, when you do your uh, history taking for the ears. So just to remember, you have to review your structures of the ear. So of course, this is your outer ear and what, uh, what is the boundary between your outer and middle ear is of course your tympanic membrane. Then in the middle ear and the inner ear, okay? So um, the, you need to, especially when a patient comes to you with ear pain, then um, try to check the, uh, particularly the external ear, okay? <clears throat> So how to go about the um, ear examination? You have to begin it with inspection and then palpation of the pina and the structures that surround the ear. Look for the possibility of um, look for the possibility of inflammation or possible infection. Okay. And afterwards, do your otoscopic examination. So uh, otoscopy is, or your diagnostic set, is used to visualize the ear canal and then look for the eardrum, okay? Um, that the purpose of this is to detect abnormal conditions that might require further evaluation or treatment. So this is the nasal speculum and your viewing window. Um, you have, if you have your diagnostic sets, you, you can observe that there are different sizes of specula. Uh, for children and even with infant, you have, a, you have a specific size of speculum for them. So how to do your otoscopic examination? Take note, okay, that um, when you hold your uh, when you hold your otoscope, so if you want to check the right, the left ear, you hold the otoscope with your left hand. And it's like you're holding a pen, okay? And then try to uh, grasp the pina and then retract backward, backward and upward in adults and downwards in children. Why? Uh, for you to have a good uh, visual on the tympanic membrane. In doing your otoscope, oh, these are the common, common mistakes. In doing your otoscopic examination, you examine the normal ear first. Okay? You examine the normal ear first before you examine the, uh, the affected ear. So, for example, if the patient complaints of a uh, tinnitus on the right ear, <clears throat> then you need to examine the left ear first before you examine the right ear. Why? For you to determine um, what is normal, what is the normal structure of your patient, normal ear structure. Okay? Because if you do, if you examine the affected ear first, then you will not know you will not know whether what you have seen in the affected ear is really abnormal or not, okay? So may, uh, make sure that when you examine the, the, the side, the left ear, then you use your right hand. And when you examine the right ear, you use your right hand, okay? So I will have, let's have a video on how to do on how to perform the otoscope. Why, why, why is it that it doesn't play anymore? Wait class. <laughs> why is it that it doesn't play anymore?
<clears throat> nice. Uh, give me a minute. Let's give me a minute. Um, five minutes. I will just um do my slides. Grammarly. The free version checks basic spelling and grammar. Grammarly Premium, on the other hand, provides in depth writing feedback to help you be more clear and concise, and it even gives vocabulary and formatting suggestions. What I love about Grammarly is it works almost every Hello, my name is Misha. I'd like to examine your ear today. Is that all right? Yes, that's great. Okay. Key, so sorry for that. So let's go back. Okay, so let's go back. <clears throat> okay, so let's do the how to perform the autoscopic examination. Thank you. I'm going to 
you've seen how the how he did it okay so those are the things these are the things that you need to identify when you do your otoscopic examination first that you have to look is the light reflex okay so when you see this light reflex it means that your tympanic membrane is okay that's intact okay so when you describe the tympanic membrane, it's either you do it like um yeah, it means that it's in intact, so there's no hole. Okay, and but um your if you have if you cannot see this light reflex, look for the possibility that. Then your, the membrane might be ruptured or previous history of otitis media. Then you check for the presence of this uh, lateral process of malleus, your pars flexa, <coughs> the handle of the malleus, the pars tensa. Uh, these actually are part of your uh, middle, middle ear. So the inner ear, you cannot see it anymore. So if you tell me that you can see the parts of the middle of the inner ear, then I'm sure you are bluffing. So you might get a minus grade for that, okay? Because you don't know what you are talking about. So these are the common pathological conditions that are related to the ear. So look for the perforation. So um, as, as I have mentioned, if you cannot see the light reflex, if the, um, the tympanic membrane is not, um, it should, it's supposed to be pearly, pearly white, okay, but um, if it's kind of, um, the, the color is not really, um, it's pearly white or uh, transparent, then there can be a presence of perforations. So you just check where the perforations will be. Tympanic sclerosis means that your tympanic membrane is already, um, how do you call it, uh, hardened. So what's the, um, how do you find the tympanic membrane there? It's usually white, not pearly white, not transparent, okay? Look for the possible middle ear effusion. So sometimes, your tympanic membrane is bulging. When you say bulging, um, the, the size or the, the position of your membrane should be flat. But when you say bulging, you can see it's like uh, it's 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 like a convex in the it the, in the how it looks like. So you can consider the possibility of a middle ear infection or otitis media. Or there can be retractions of the drum. So if there's a retractions of the drum, then you might sus suspect of a possible uh, injury, previous injury. And of course, blood in the middle ear. So these are the common pathological conditions. So uh, sometimes the common, uh, common uh, complaint of your patient here will be, some will, experience, will complain of pain, some will complain of discharge. Okay, so when a, or some will do complain of decreased hearing loss. So if your patient comes to you with that, you need to do um, an otoscopic examination first. So even if it is a decreased hearing, do an otoscopic examination first before you do your hearing test. Another conditions, well, we don't call it pathological, but when a patient comes to you with decreased hearing, do your otoscopic exam and look whether your patient has impacted cerumen or not. What do we mean by impacted cerumen? It means that uh, the ear has been blocked by wax. Okay, So that can be um, one of the reasons why there's this uh, uh, slight 
decrease in hearing because there is a blockage in your canal. So what do you see? Of course, you will only see wax. Sometimes it's black. It's totally black that it blocks the canal. So some last time in 4B, they even discharge, they, they even um, describe the uh, the uh, the tympanic membrane. If with that I gave them zero already because you cannot see anything when there is an impacted cerumen. What you can only see is this. You can say it's a black wax. It's a hardened wax. That's it. And this is usually um, how do you manage it? Then you do your oral um, oral toala or toilet. We say it. Okay. So after doing your proper um, proper um, otoscopic examination, then you do your tuning fork test. So what's the purpose of tuning fork test? That is the use. Its use is to differentiate types of hearing loss. But of course, there are three types of um, hearing tests. You have your whisper test, and then you do your tuning fork test, the Weber and the Rene. So the tuning fork test is used to differentiate what type of he uh, hearing loss your patient has. So it can be a sensory neural or conductive he hearing loss. So in the Weber test, this is how you do it. You, um, in the Weber, you, 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 you tap your tuning fork like this and then place it, the, place the handle at the, uh, at the midline of the forehead. So a normal Weber test, um, is when the sound radiates to both ears equally, okay? And if one sound lateralizes to one ear, what do we mean by lateralization? It means that the patient can hear um, at the one ear greater, the sound on one ear, ear, one ear greater than the other ear. So if the patient will, if your patient complains of a, Decrease hearing loss on the right ear. And when you do your Weber test and the patient says, I hear more on the right ear, then we call it an ipsilateral uh, lateralization. So you, you suspect of a conductive hearing loss. But if your patient will say, I hear better, or the sound is greater on the left ear, then you have a contralateral lateralization. Then you suspect of a sensory neural loss. So where do we usually put the tuning fork? It's either on the midline forehead or any part of the teeth, particularly on the, how do you call it? That, uh, that tooth in front. So that's where you put the Weber, the tuning fork. test okay you are con you are checking the bone and air conduction so we take note that you only tap okay you only tap the tuning fork once once you tap it once you place it on the mastoid area uh, before you put it in the mastoid area you ask your patient to cover the opposite ear with your hand. And then uh, tap it and then place the tuning fork on the mastoid area. Then you ask your patient, okay? Uh, if, if your patient can hear the sound and once the sound stop, you transfer the tuning fork near the uh the, the ear okay because this is when you are testing the air conduction so when your patient says i can't hear the sound anymore from the bone 
while after po, uh, placing on the mastoid area, do not tap the tuning fork again. You just tap it once, okay? So once the patient says, I can't hear anymore, you place it immediately in front of the ear, okay? And then indicate when you ask your patient when the sound stop. It is better if you have something to, uh, to really time when uh, the sound stop so that you will det really determine whether bone conduction is greater than the air conduction, okay? Okay, so this is how to do your hearing assessment with otoscopy also. Hi, my name is Andrew, one of the final year medical students. Could I just confirm your name and date of birth, please? Sure, it's James, 13th of December, 1989. Nice to meet you, James. Today, I'd like to examine your ears. This will just involve looking inside the ears with a piece of equipment called the otoscope and then using a number of different tests to examine your hearing. Would that be okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. James, I'm now gonna start with a simple hearing test. I'm gonna stand behind you and I'm gonna speak three different numbers into each ear. I want you to repeat them back to me when you hear them. 66. 66. 43. 43. 71. 71. 66. 60. 41. 41. 43. 23. I'm now going to place this tuning fork in the middle of your forehead. Let me know whether you hear it loudest in one ear or the other or the middle. It's in the middle. Okay. I'm now going to place this tuning fork on the bone behind your ear. I'd like you to let me know when you can no longer hear the sound. I can hear that. It's can you hear it now? Yeah. Okay. So have I hope you've seen it. Okay, so that's how you do it. So again, to remind you, you need to tap the tuning fork only once. How to interpret your test? Okay, so for, um, for reading really test, the normal is air conduction is greater than bone conduction. And that is your, the really test is positive. So if, Air conduction and bone conduction is normal. It can also be seen in sensory neural deafness. Okay, so um, you need to um, for for the in this case you need to do another test, which is the Weber. Okay, if the bone conduction is greater than the air conduction, the linear test is negative. So it is more of a conductive hearing loss. For Weber, uh, for Weber, no lateralization, meaning the patient can hear both sounds equally. If uh, the, the patient can hear the sound on the affected ear, then it is an ipsilateral um, lateralization. Therefore, it is a conductive hearing loss. If the patient can hear more on the better ear, then it is a contralateral um, lateralization. So it is a sensory neural deafness, okay? So I will, uh, we, we, don't, we will not discuss the ABC and the swab box anymore because what we usually use is the Rene and the Weber. So how do you, so that's for hearing loss. Now, what if your patient comes to you uh, with a um, decrease and then when you do your otoscopic examination, you see a um, impacted cerumen. So 
you do your oral irrigation or, or oral toilet. So, of course, impacted, therefore, the wax is already hardened. So, you need to soften it by putting several drops of baby oil on the affected ear two to three times daily over a period of a few days. Of course, there are medicines to, uh, to use, but in the event that you don't, your patient does not have any money, then they can use your baby oil. So once the wax is softened, you can do your oral irrigation. So how to go about it? Watch this. <laughs> So don't forget to remove the needle, okay? So you just use the, the nozzle of the syringe. Then sometimes what we do is, um, well, I, the, the part of the abocaf, we cut it and then that's when we will put the uh, so when we would put the here on this portion so that we that's how we use the that's how we do the irrigation. Okay, I'm going to place this over your shoulder. So I'm going to ask you to hold this under your ear. Okay, towards the ear canal, not in the ear canal. I'm just going to clean your ear, okay? It depends. Um, do you have to perform that? It depends on your facilitator. It depends on your um, examiner. Okay. 
So again, uh, let me remind you before you do your exam, uh, before you do this, before you do everything, don't forget to wash your hand. Okay. Any question for the ear? Nando. Okay. Uh, for a while, class. Okay, so next is nose. So this is the focus history taking with the nose. You need to assess the function. Okay, at the dial, you don't need to have the iodine solution. Uh, sometimes you just, just make sure that you have the, the uh, instruments or the materials. And then you have, to, you have to improvise, you can do that. And then you can do, you just explain the process. Because of course, uh, you not really do the oral irrigation per se. So most of the time, they will just ask you to show how to do it. So probably it's better if you have the towel and you have your kidney basin. It doesn't necessarily, if, there, if it's a basin, kidney basin, but anything that will support to be, um, how do you call it? When, of course, when you do your irrigation, something that will hold on the water, okay? Okay, Adidayo. Okay, <clears throat> now for the nose, you assess the function, if there's airy, airway resistance and occasionally sense of smell. So sometimes, I take history taking of the nose, uh, you have to include if there are symptoms on the mouth and the pharynx. Check and ask if there's a frequent sneezing, nasal itchiness, nasal congestion, rhinorrhea. When you say rhinorrhea, that's your runny nose. There is anosmia or loss of uh, smell. There's facial pain uh, if your patient snores. If your patient has histories of allergies or A2P, if you have pets, if your patients have pets at home, what is his occupation and history of previous surgery? So examination of the nose is done in three parts. First is you have to examine the external nose, then you do the anterior rhinoscopy and posterior rhinoscopy. Um, ex examination on, of your external nose is you have to ask your patient to remove if he's wearing his glasses. Yes, then look at the nose yes, from the front yes, and side for any signs of the falling. Look at the size and shape if there is deformity. Okay. Uh, sometimes a deviated nose is often best look at the above. Look if there's swelling if there's scars, if there's redness, 
um, these are usually evidence of skin disease. So what are these? Retinas, sometimes you check whether there is pimples, okay, or infection, okay. There's discharge or crusting, <laughs> and if there is an offensive smell. So you look for a congenital, uh, uh, look for deformities. So we've mentioned that already swelling and ulcerations. Then try to palpate the nose. Check if there is tenderness, crepitus, or deformities. So how to go your anterior rhinoscopy? You use your nasal speculum. Okay. So how to go about it? You put the speculum and the nares on the vestibule. Check if there's boil or abscesses, if there's ulcerations and abrasions or excoriation. Okay. So let's do it again. This is and inner rhinoscopy. In and inner rhinoscopy, we use the silicon nasal spectrum. The nasal spectrum hold in the hold in position like this in the index finger. We can support with the ring finger and the middle finger and introduce in the nasal cavity and examine the nasal cavity. First of all, we go for the checking for any abnormality in the nasal cavity, like any mass or any growth in the nasal cavity. We look for the any septal deviation in the nasal cavity and for any other abnormality. Then we go for the anti-rhinoscopy. This the position of the Sutton's uh, nasal spectrum. Slightly patient is like this, slightly focus on the nasal cavity, and then introduce the both upper and lower uh, like this position. So introduce the nasal cavity and examine for we look for the uh, lateral part of the nasal cavity, nasal flow, septum, and for the uh, inferior and middle terminate. We could not see the superior terminate with the help of the anterior rhinoscopy. And we examine for the any nasal foreign body, any nasal mass, growth, or any. <coughs> and the septum. This is the whole procedure of uh, anterior rhinoscopy. Thank you. Okay. Anterior rhinoscopy. Anterior. So that's anterior. So what you will just need in the anterior rhinoscopy is to check. Um, do you use your nasal speculum? Then you open the nares and then look if there are inflammation, if there's infection, if there's boil. Okay. Sometimes you can see pimples inside your nose, so that can be a cause of the pain in the nose. Okay. Now, what about posterior rhinoscopy? So this is how you do it. Hold the mirror like a pen in the right hand. Try, to, uh, don't forget to warm the mirror. That is to uh, sterilize it, but not as hot. Okay. Then ask the patient to open the mouth and depress the anterior two-thirds of the tongue using your tongue depressor. So introduce, you feel the warmth of the mirror. Then introduce the mirror from the angle of the mouth over the tongue depressor, depressor and slide it behind the uvula. Avoid touching the posterior wall of the pharynx as it may trigger gagging. Then instruct the patient to breathe through the nose, then try to tilt the mirror in different direction to see the various structures of the nasopharynx. Okay, okay, uh oh. So this is how to go about your posterior rhinoscopy. So this is, you, you depress the tongue and use your, this is your posterior rhinoscopy mirror, okay? So it differs from your dental mirror because in dental mirror, is, um, the handle is usually straight. Then you can see the different parts of the mesopharynx. Posterior rhinoscopy, we use the posterior rhinoscopic mirror. This mirror is slightly curved. The angle is 120 to 130 degrees. And the second instrument used in the posterior rhinoscopy is the we depress the tongue with the help of tongue depressor and the mirror is introduced in the old cavity and examine the nasopharynx. 
part of the nasal pharynx, posterior part of the nasal cavity. Now we will go to the procedure that is focused on the patient. The patient is warm with the of the student's check and then introduced from the side of the oral cavity and examine the part of the nasal pharynx, station tube opening, posa, posterior blood, adenoids, posterior part of the poina and the posterior part of the inferior terminate and the some part of the middle terminate and we examine for the any pathology or <coughs> any abnormal thing in the nasal pharynx. This is the whole procedure of uh, posterior rhinoscopy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So that's how posterior you do rhinos posterior rhinoscopy. Okay. Our next um, common complaint for our patient is epistaxis or nose bleeding. So in this um, video, um, the, the doctor will discuss to you the common causes of epistaxis, how to prevent it and treatment, okay? Of course, um, the common, common thing that you will do is to put pressure, how to go about it, and you can do a nasal packing in the event that the bleeding is still uh, continuously, uh, even if you put pressure, okay? So what is the common question for epistaxis is um, the com what are the common causes of epistaxis, how to go about it, okay? And how are you going to check, okay? So of course, if the patient comes to you with nose bleeding, you need to do a history taking, do an examination. So you do your external examination and then do your anterior rhinoscopy. So if uh, the bleeding is, a, is um, if, there's a, if there's a bleeding, okay? Meaning um, the patient, when you look at the patient, there's really bleeding. Then you do your um, pressure first. You need to stop the bleeding first before you do your examination, okay? But while doing those things, you need to do, um, you need to have your history already. So if your patient is hyper, with hypertensive, then how are you going to manage it aside from stopping stoppage of the bleeding? Then you just need to check the blood pressure and then give antihypertensive is needed, if needed, okay? So, there's another one question here. Okay. So, uh, Hi, I'm it. Jane Liu, and I'm an otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, or your nose and throat doctor here in Los Angeles. And today I wanted to talk about nosebleeds. Anybody can have nosebleeds, but usually they're very mild. If you have a lot of nosebleeds on a regular basis, or if they're severe, it might be worth seeing in your nose and throat doctor. Anything that makes your nose dry is going to increase the likelihood of bleeding. So if you spend a lot of time in a desert and go to Phoenix or Las Vegas, it's more likely to bleed. If it's wintertime and cold and you're cranking up that old dry radiator heat and it's sucking all of the moisture out of the air, that's going to increase the likelihood of bleeding as well. Certainly trauma to the nose. So if you get punched, if you pick your nose too hard, those can cause breaks in the surface and cause some bleeding. Are more likely to burst and leak water when the water pressure is high. Same is true for blood vessels. So if your blood pressure is running high, you're more likely at that moment to pop a bleed. If you have an underlying clotting disorder like von Willebrand's or hemophilia, then nosebleeds are going to be more common. A lot of medications also thin out the blood, like aspirin, Advil, Motrin, ibuprofen, Aleve, most of the over-counter pain medicines, except for Tylenol. Any patient that's taking warfarin, Coumadin, Plavix, or other blood thinning medications is also going to be at increased risk for nosebleeds. To handle the dryness, it usually helps to have a humidifier. It also may be useful to have saline or salt water spray for your nose. Just like chapped lips that get dry and split, you can slather on a bunch of ointment to try to get the area to heal. Inside the nose, that can be using Neosporin or Bacitracin or some other over-the-counter antibiotic ointment. It can be using Vaseline or saline gel or air gel. There really isn't a specific brand that's going to be a lot better than the other, but the concept or the ideas like chapstick for the lips. 
To apply ointment in the nose, the area that we want to get is the septum in the middle and along the floor. So you can either use your finger as just this little pad here at the tip or with a Q-tip, and you want to gently apply it without traumatizing the area. You certainly want to avoid trauma to the nose. That can be nose picking. It can be very harsh nose blowing. You really don't want to fuss with the nose too much. If you have high blood pressure, you want to make sure that the blood pressure is as controlled as possible. You generally also want to avoid activities that give you a sudden surge in blood pressure. So think of anything that makes little veins in your head pop out. That includes exercising, lifting weights, uh, doing a headstand or handstand. You want to take it easy as things are trying to heal. If you're taking over-the-counter pain medicines like Motrin, Ibuprofen, Advil, generally a good idea to take a break for a little bit. If you're on blood thinning medications or aspirin for your heart, make sure you talk to your regular doctor before you stop these. We've talked a little bit about what causes nosebleeds and how to avoid them or minimize them. Now I'm going to talk about how to control one when it's actually happening. Almost always, nosebleeds are going to be from the front of the nose along the septum in the middle, and it's usually due to dryness. So you get a little crack in the skin and the blood vessels, and it just pours out. Almost always, like any other bleeding source, you want to put pressure. So if you get a big cut on your arm and it's pumping to the ceiling, you want to put pressure right there. So for the nose, that means pinching it right down in the front. If you only push on one the side, it kind of shoves everything over, but it doesn't get as much pressure on it, so you really want to push on both. Hold it that way for a few minutes to give your body enough time to form a clot, and then you should be okay. A lot of people recommend pinching up here by the nasal bridge, but that actually doesn't put pressure directly on the bleeding source. That usually isn't going to be that helpful. A lot of people will take tissues and shove it inside the nostril. That may stop the bleeding, but when you take it out, you're left with a more dry area that may lead to more bleeding later. And sometimes when you take out the tissue, you pull off the clot that's been forming and it starts all over again. Ideally, you want to stop sticking and taking things out of your nose. You want to keep the level of your head above the heart. That's going to be best from a bleeding standpoint. But if you've been bleeding enough where you're lightheaded, you may need to lie down just so that you don't pass out. Bending your head forward or back only changes the direction of where the blood comes out. So bending forward is more likely to drip through the front of your nose. Bending back is more likely to drip down to your throat. Either way, it doesn't slow down the bleeding. Cold temperature will help clamp down on blood vessels. That's why you get really pale when you're out in the freezing weather. So if you're having nosebleeds, what you want to do is apply something cold. That means potentially drinking or gargling with ice water putting something cold over your face and nose. You can even stick ice chips or ice cubes inside the mouth. The floor of the nose is the roof of the mouth, so that will help cut down on the bleeding. You want to avoid things that increase blood flow, like heat or hot liquids. If you have a lot of nosebleeds, another thing that's helpful to have around the house is nasal spray or oxymetazoline. It's generally a decongestant, it's over the counter, but during a bleed, it really helps clamp down on the blood vessels. Almost every ear, nose, and throat doctor uses Afrin in the operating room to cut down on bleeding for nasal surgeries. If you have bleeding that's more dramatic or more severe or more prolonged and can't be controlled by the methods that I've talked about, then there are certainly options that the ear, nose, and throat doctor may provide. At the end of the day, we want to keep things as moist as possible. We want to minimize the trauma. We want to keep the blood pressure normal. We want to avoid things that make the blood thin if we can. Yeah. Hopefully this helps. If you have any additional questions, please leave it in the comments below. Okay. Hi, I'm Jean. So thank Hi. you. <clears throat> so actually, this is how they do with the nasal pain packing. So you don't need to do that during the during your ask. Probably they can just ask you how to go about it, and that's it. But they will not ask you to do it. Okay. So. This is how to do your anterior packing. Step five, anterior packing. Be prepared before you start. Protect yourself and gather all the equipment that you will need so that it's within arm's reach. Shown here is a typical trolley for dealing with epistaxis. On it, you should have a Thetacum's nasal speculum, a tongue depressor, anesthesia, we prephenolephrine for lidocaine solution, 
suction. A yanker is often too big for anterior bleeds, so a smaller phrasal suction tip or equivalent is more suited. A size 12 female urinary catheter or bony or posterior packs, silver nitrate sticks, rapid drying or anterior packs, and knee septum cream. Bear in mind this cream contains peanut, so ask about allergies and consider batch of them as a long term thing. In addition to this, have ready some ribbon gauze and a 10 ml syringe filled with air. As this may be a significant bleed, ensure you have your venous access before you begin to pack. Changes for anterior packing, shown here for later reference. Release the tarification if needed. Use a good light source and explain the procedure to the patient. Give them a kidney dish and position them correctly. They should be sat upright in a chair and you should be sat close. The positions for both right-handed and left-handed doctors are shown. Use nasal thidicum to visualize the nasal flow prior to insertion. This allows for compensation for differing anatomy, for example, in deviated septum. From experience for patients, so please ensure that they are written up for good analgesia, including opiates. Remember that the floor of the nose lies in a horizontal plane. It is natural for the patient to tilt his head upwards. Discourage this as it makes your orientation harder. Insert the pack, keeping as close to the floor of the nose as you can. Slowly, place up to 10 number of air, reassessing hemostasis. Tubing from the rapid rhino should be taped to the patient's cheek, as shown. post pack care is important. You might also consider placing a nasal booster to collect infections. If this is unsuccessful, repeat the process again with the other nostril to tampon out the septum. If the packs fail to achieve hemostasis and blood continues to trickle down the back of the throat, or if it's clinically evident that there is a posteriorly situated bleeding point, then you will need to discuss okay. management options. anymore that's very technical okay now let's do the neck examination so when do we do the neck examination sometimes your patient comes to you with complaining of difficulty of swallowing of course when your patient comes to you with swallowing and you do your history and history taking uh, what you have to think of the what could be the common causes of difficulty of swallowing. So one of course is probably your patient has tonsillitis or pharyngitis or laryngitis, but most of the time um, those diseases will present as a painful swallowing. Now for difficulty of swallowing check, you need to check the neck. So aside from checking the throat, the oral cavity and the throat, you need to check the neck. Why? Uh, you need to look for the uh, presence of um, lymphadenopathies. And of course, if you can palpate the thyroid gland. Look for the possibility of anterior neck mass. Because that's one of the complaints uh, for um, thyromegaly. Okay? Difficulty of swallowing or sometimes... There, they can, there is this feeling when they swallow, okay? So again, I will show you this one. This video shows how to examine the neck. The examiner has already washed his hands, introduced himself, explained the procedure and obtained the patient's consent. He has also asked if the patient has any pain anywhere and obtained adequate exposure of the neck. Start by inspecting the neck from all angles looking for scars, obvious lumps, and any skin changes. Please take a sip of water and hold it in your mouth. And now could you swallow it, please? As the patient swallows, look for a thyroid mass, which will move on swallowing. Thanks very much. Could you open up your mouth and stick your tongue out? As the patient sticks their tongue out, look for a thyroglossal cyst, which which is a midline lump that will move upwards on tongue protrusion. And take, place your tongue away and stick your tongue out. Get the patient to open their mouth before sticking their tongue out, as jaw movement can also cause movement of neck structures. Very good. Thank you very much. Next, palpate the neck from behind. 
having warned the patient what you're about to do. Palpate all six levels of lymph nodes in the neck. Start at level one, which is the submental and submandibular lymph nodes, and also feel for the submandibular gland. Next, feel the level two lymph nodes, which are the upper jugular nodes. Then the level three lymph nodes of the middle third of the jugular, moving on to the level four nodes of the lower jugular. Palpate the posterior triangle of the neck, which is level five. Then palpate the central area of the neck, which is level six. Could you take a mouthful of water and hold it in your mouth, please? If you could now swallow. Feel for any thyroid masses which will move on swallowing. Thank you very much. Remember to palpate the postauricular and preauricular lymph nodes and also to feel over the parotid gland for any masses. If you were to find a lump in the neck, fully examine it as you would in a lump examination. So the lymph node areas of the neck consist of level one, which is the submandibular triangle, which is the margin of the mandible, the midline, uh, and um, the anterior border of the thyroid cartilage. Level two, which is the upper jugular nodes. Level three, which is the mid jugular nodes. And level four, which is the lower jugular nodes. These are all underneath the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which runs from the sternal and um, clavicular heads to the mastoid tip. The posterior triangle is level five, and this is from the posterior margin of the sternocleidomastoid uh, to the anterior margin of the trapezius and the, and the collarbone. Level six is the central compartment of the neck, which is completely filled by the thyroid gland. The parotid extends from an area in front of the tragus over the side of the cheek. The tail of the parotid runs into the top of the neck and underneath the pinna in this area here. The submandibular gland is in the submandibular triangle underneath the jaw in this area here. Okay, so this that's how you um, examine the neck. Then you can do, of course, part of the examination is to check the oral cavity. So when you do your, when you check the oral cavity, check the tongue, uh, you have to ask for the common taste sensations. Check the size of the tongue. Um, if the tongue is um, large, you call it the macroglossia. You, but there's a possibility of uh, acromegaly or Down syndrome. Look for the ulcers. Look for the movements of the tongue. Um, check whether there is palsies. Check for the fasciculation because if you check for the there's fasciculation, then the possibility of motor neuron disease. Population, meaning remember in, in the tongue, there is this papilla. So in the population, some there is the, um, the tongue is so shiny that you cannot bear, uh, really see the papilla. So the possibility of vitamin deficiencies. And if there's coating, like a white coat, can be a, a thrush or a check for a black hairy tongue. The buccal mucosa, look for the parotid duct opening. It's usually seen on the opposite upper second molar, the red and white patches and the ulcers. Check at the heart palate, okay? If there's swelling, ulcer, perforations are cleft. Check for the uvula, uh, if there's deviations. Uh, on the floor of the mouth, Check for the Wharton duct opening. Do a bimanual palpation and check for the teeth and possible occlusion. If, of course, while doing all of those things, you can you have to wear your gloves. Okay, don't forget it. So, um, 
sometimes uh, you can uh, with the help of your uh, tongue depressor you can do it um, to make the the opening of the oral cavity bigger check for the oral pharynx sometimes you do your posterior rhinoscopy more or less you will have an idea but uh, in oral pharynx you are looking at the soft palate the tonsils whether the tonsils are there or if not then you ask for a surgery previous surgery the size of the tonsils the crepes the, if there's an ulcers check for the posterior pharyngeal wall a look at the lymphoid follicles and ulcers okay so this is how you do your mouth examination this video covers the examination okay. of the mouth the examiner has already washed his The parotid can also be bimanually palpated, and the saliva can be expressed through the parotid duct opening seen here. This concludes the examination of the mouth and the oral cavity. Thank you. Okay, so that's it. This is the reminders for all of you. Make sure that you have a patient. Okay, it doesn't matter whether it's a child, your your. Uh, your child, your mother, your father, your siblings, your grandparents, okay? Make sure that you have a patient. Uh, it, uh, being alone in your room is not an excuse. Being alone in your house is not an excuse. Because if you don't have a patient, uh, that means you fail. Yes, um, Vanessa? Um, yes, Doc. Um... I know this will be done um, later this month, but what if I have COVID? Like, actually, I have COVID right now. I cannot help patients. Can I take uh, patients with me? In that, event, in that case, you need to um, inform Dr. Maniwa or Dean that you cannot have a patient and probably they will make... Um, it's either you will be excused from doing it in the meantime and you will have your makeup. But maybe, Doc, um, I will take um, someone who has also COVID, so <laughs> this should be covered. Uh, you have to ask them. Because um, in this case, we, we don't ask, like, you explain the mechanics because we need to see how you do it. So in that event, uh, you have to um, ask permission from Dr. Maniwa or to Dean and inform them of your uh, present condition. When did, when was, um, when was your, you were, you were diagnosed when? Uh, I tested myself with an antigen and it came back positive three days ago. <clears throat> three days ago. So for a healthcare worker, uh, fully vaccinated, that's seven days. Uh, the recent guy, the recent guidelines, which was issued yesterday uh, for the isolation for COVID positive for healthcare workers, 
is a um, maximum of seven days, minimum of five days. So there's no more um, 14 days. For uh, partially or unvaccinated, that's 10 days. So in that event, if you, were, if you tested yourself three days ago, by next week, you will, you can now, you will now be cleared for, um, if you're a healthcare worker, you will be fit get for work. But in, uh, in the others who unfortunately, and I hope not that you will have, you will be exposed and you will be, uh, um, you will have, a, a, um, you will contract the virus, then what I can uh, advise is to inform Dr. Maniwa immediately so that Dr. Maniwa can inform, um, can, in, can advise you what to do and inform the faculty who will be handling you. Okay. So again, to remind, yes. Again, to remind you, no patient. If you don't have a patient, um, that's equivalent to failure. So they will not ask you any more questions. If you don't have instruments like, um, wait, <laughs> a ZZZ, those, uh, the, the name is uh, sleeping. <laughs> if you don't have instruments, uh, as I have said, try to improvise. Um, you just don't say, I don't have instruments. So you just say, um, can I use this? Because some of the faculty, they will allow you. But there are Um, if they don't feel uh, comfortable uh, during the process, not, not to hesitate to inform you. So once in a while, you have to ask them, are you okay? Something like that. Okay. And again, make sure to explain the procedure to your patient. Actually, those are the things that I, uh, uh, that I often see uh, from the previous batches that the mistakes that they have committed. So when you do your otoscopic, the, the common is again, they go directly, examine directly the affected ear. So when you are doing your otoscopic examination, examine the normal ear first for the unaffected ear before the affected ear. Okay, any question? <clears throat> Any question, class? Oh. Yes. Doc, okay. uh, when we do Weber's test, right? So we are placing the tuning fork in the in the middle, in the middle of the forehead, right? So how okay. can we lateralize, Doc? Whether it is ipsilateral or contralateral, because we are placing in the middle anyway. So you can, because if you put it, because you're doing a con, con, bone conduction. So if you do it there, if you, you put it there, you will listen equally. You can listen it equally. And if there is a problem on on what which part of the ear, the sound is greater on that affected ear, that's contactive hearing loss. And if the sound is greater compared to the other ear on the normal ear, then that is sensory neuron. If the sound is equal, then that's normal. Yes, Doc, but uh, what, what, what my question is like, you know, Doc, um, we are placing in the middle. How can we say that is it on the same side and it is on the opposite side? Since you are placing in the middle, Doc, like. Yes, you can, you, know, you just ask them. Can you hear the sound equally on both ears? 
Okay. Okay. Yes. So sometimes they give you cases. So for example, oh, you, this is your case. You have this certain patient who claims of a decreased hearing loss on the left ear. So perform the hearing test. Of course, uh, sometimes it's better if you do your otoscopic examination also to get points, okay? But for the hearing ears, so make sure that you make sure that um, you can explain the possible results of your um, skills that they have asked you. Because that is part of the uh, question, and answer, question and answer. So aside from the skills, um, the question and answer portion also is um, graded. So if your case is like there's a hearing loss on the right ear, do a Weber. So when you say, um, when the patient will say, uh, there's lateralization on the right ear, or there's no lateralization, then the, the ear is normal. Something. But if the patient will say, uh, I can hear the sound better in the right ear rather than on the left ear, then that's a conductive hearing loss. Something like that. So what I can say is before you do your OSCE, before you are being asked, you already talk to your patient. So your patient will, for example, you are in line in for OSCE, then you will say, okay, if they will ask me to do a hearing test, if the hearing loss is right or if the hearing loss is left, this should be your answer so that you can, you know, <coughs> you, you have to, uh, how do you call it? What's the term? Um, I forgot the term. Anyway, you, you ask, you, you, um, you give instructions to your patient. Okay? Did, did I answer your question, Hamidula? Yes, Doc. Yes, Doc. Okay. Any more question? Doc, uh, um, how, how the OSC will be conducted, Doc? Is it like uh, we need to present a patient and we need to go straight away to the ECMP and PE or will you present us the case and we need to explain those to our patient or like how it would go down? Um, you will be given a scenario. Okay. okay. You're given a scenario and then the, the, your faculty will ask will tell you what they would, what they will want you to do. Okay. Usually, that's how I do it. Uh, with the other okay. uh, faculty, I don't know. <laughs> but okay, but generally, procedure. most yes. of the times we will be doing PE, no doubt. Yes. The procedures. Most okay. of the time. Uh, not much with the history. The history, usually we do it... Um, as part of the question and answer. Side questions, I, I should say. Okay, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Okay. Any more? Dog. Yes. We're stopping. We. Z Z Z. Okay. Duration for Oscar. Um. For me, I give them seven as because usually they will give us ten, ten students for an hour. So. For me, I do it like uh, five to seven minutes, all taps. Other faculty, they do it faster. Other faculty, if you cannot answer very well, it's either 
they will give you a chance or they will just say thank you. So at the tops, probably five, five to seven minutes. Uh, hmm. so, uh, five to seven <laughs> minutes, how many examination we have to do, like how many questions? It depends on how you go about it. It depends on how you go about it. So um, sometimes if you there is something wrong with your uh, procedure, then they will ask you questions for that. For that. Sagufta. Yeah, Sagufta, if a case is given of no split, should I proceed to manage the patient first or take history first and do test and management during OSCE? Um, you will ask, ma'am, is it an active bleeding? If, if, you, if your patient, will, if your uh, faculty is yes, then um, I will do, I will, um, because it depends on what they will ask you. So if your patient will ask you do a history, do a, a physical examination or procedures and what, how are you going to manage it? So if it's an active bleeding, so you will just tell them, can I, I will stop the bleeding first before I proceed with history and procedures. And then you tell them, uh, put pressure. And then once the bleeding stops, then I will proceed with my history. So that's it, how to go about with your history. Um, for ENT, yes, mostly PE, but I don't know with, well, yes, actually, because with OSCE, what we are looking at is the skills, the skills, the procedures, how to go about with your skills. So it's mostly physical examination. Uh, for the theoretical, it's um, usually done when they have asked your side questions. Okay, any more questions? So, if there's no more question, I will. As for those who want to leave, um, they can do so. For those who want to stay and ask more questions, it's okay. I will be here um, until 4 o'clock.